Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Ubell, and I'm delighted to see uh, friends, uh, students, and others, faculty, trustees here. And uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, President Srinivasan, Commissioner Brill, uh, Professor Memon, faculty, students, and our distinguished guests. It's a distinct pleasure to welcome those here at NYU and others who are across the globe participating uh, via video streaming to this uh, third in a series of Sloan-sponsored lectures on cybersecurity. Uh, I was delighted to host this event and also all the previous events that go into making this uh, quite unusual for Polly and for the world that distinguished speakers and others participate in a uh, intellectually stimulating and fundamental area of uh, what uh, is important today, uh, not only on the internet, but uh, through mobile devices, uh, as you will hear. Uh, we owe special thanks to our generous sponsor, um, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and particularly to its program director, Paula Olsuski, who happens to be a police Paula stand, uh, and uh, to um, it's Paula who uh, 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 understood the importance of this and uh, with the help of the Sloan Foundation uh, was instrumental in making this possible. Um, a very special welcome to uh, members of the audience from the FTC, uh, as well as uh, several from Attorney General's offices. We have one from uh, New York State right here, and I believe others uh, are here or online from Ohio, Massachusetts, and Illinois. Obviously, this is a, a uh, critical issue for um, law in, at the state level as also at the national level, and certainly internationally as well. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Bill Harry and Ray Zimmerman, who are here uh, from the Chris board. If you look at your program uh, on the back side, you'll see the other members of the Chris board. Uh, they are uh, across uh, the university and have uh, responsibilities uh, intellectually and research, uh, cybersecurity and uh, behavior. Of course, this is one of the areas of behavior uh, that we're keen on. Uh, uh, the uh, other member of the uh, Chris board, Helen Nissenbaum, is not here today. Uh, she's uh, on leave uh, on a sabbatical, I believe, in Israel, uh, but she was instrumental in making this possible. It was her uh, spark uh, that ignited this event. Um, it's a privilege to be given the honor to introduce our first speaker, NYU Poly President uh, Katapeli Srinivasan who will be delivering this morning's welcome address. Srini, as he likes to be called, is a noted physicist, engineer, and not least a champion of humanitarian causes. He not only serves as Polly's president, but as university professor and vice provost of NYU for science and technology across NYU's global network university in Abu Dhabi, uh, Shanghai, and in numerous other places around the world. Among his many honors, he has the trifecta of science and intellectual life. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Early next year, when Polly emerges as the engineering school of NYU, uh, we will be transformed from NYU Poly uh, and this logo to some other new logo, uh, which identifies as the School of Engineering. Uh, Srini will be uh, this new engineering school at NYU as its first dean. It is especially fitting that he assumes this role now. From its earliest days in the 19th century, Polly has held a special place in science and engineering, not only in Brooklyn, I was born there, but across the city, the nation, and around the world. Srini will now lead this institution that has an enormously productive history and will take us, Polly, to the next level. President Srinivasan.
Thank you, Bob. Do you want this cell phone or not? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Brill, distinguished uh, members of the panel, I have the great pleasure of uh, welcoming you to NYU Poly, as we like to call ourselves now. And to this event in particular, I am uh, looking forward to the Sloan Lecture by Commissioner Brill and uh, the panel discussion that will follow uh, later. Thank you all for being here. I know you are very busy and you are otherwise engaged and I greatly appreciate you being here. Um, actually, that's where I should stop, but I have uh, an institutional responsibility to say a few words about poly. I'll therefore carry on for a bit longer. Um, Poly has changed its name many times, so you may not know its entire history. Um, it started uh, as a Brooklyn Collegiate and Polytechnic Institute, actually by the generosity of a woman, uh, Harriet Packer. Mostly I've been told um, to educate uh, cultured young women that are worthy of uh, uh, young ladies in Brooklyn. At that time, uh, Brooklyn was a very thriving place where all the immigrant population just moved from, from uh, Manhattan. And uh, it was known as Brooklyn Poly uh, from 1889 and kept that name for 80 and odd uh, years. And um, it's really well known, very well known to many people as Brooklyn Poly even today. But in 1973, as uh, many of you might know, NYU was in financial distress and uh, the Heights campus in Bronx had to be sold and the faculty from there, engineering and uh, some science faculty, were moved to Poly. In other words, um, that part of uh, NYU merged with Poly at the time. And then it became um, Polytechnic Institute of New York. It was no longer simply Brooklyn. And then it uh, thought uh, a little more pretentiously and became a universe, university. Now we are um, Polytechnic Institute of New York University. We merged in 2008 or got affiliated with NYU. And um, soon, as Bob already said, we will be School of Engineering of NYU. Who knows when this evolution will end? Uh, but <laughs> we are evolving to something for sure. <laughs> However, there are some threads that have um, been constant throughout Polly's history, and that's what I want to say, and I want to lead to the particular topic of today's uh, uh, talk and then um, say a few uh, words of thanks. So except for a short period following the merger of NYU's Heights campus in 1973, Poly has always been very small, relatively speaking, for a university. But it had very strong traditions of high-level research and innovation the work of its professors in hypersonic aerodynamics, polymer chemistry, microwave electronics, crystallography, etc., has strongly influenced all the people in those fields at that time and later. Polis alumni have produced very important, uh, have been awarded very important prizes, such as Nobel Prize, uh, Turing Award, Pulitzer Prize, and the uh, National Medal of Science. The phrase American Dream is credited to a Pali alumnus. More than this, Pali has always been known for its innovative spirit, in my opinion. Its alumnus, Jasper Kane, is credited to have been responsible for the mass production of penicillin that is estimated to have saved some million lives in the Second World War. The company that produced it was Pfizer, 
and that's the auditorium, I mean the name of the auditorium in which we are uh, gathered today. Uh, its alumnus Eugene Kleiner is credited with creating much of the Silicon Valley of its time. Even ordinary sounding inventions from Pauli had profound impact. For example, the invention of uh, elevator brake, um, which might sound very mundane to us today, was what enabled high rises to be built and it changed the landscape of uh, many cities all through the world and particularly Manhattan. The other important characteristic of Pauli is its commitment to the immigrant population. In its heydays, Brooklyn was the place where the immigrants settled, as uh, also you know, away from the overcrowded uh, uh, Manhattan um, borough. And so many of the Brooklyn children who went to Pauli were first in their families to go to college. A large number of successful people went to the night school at Pauli and became a uh, great uh, um, part, part of this society. Pauli thus has these two strands in its DNA, great originality and inventiveness and its commitment to educating immigrant people whose families themselves were not well to do or not well educated. Even during some difficult years, Pali has maintained the tradition. This year, for instance, among the people we admitted, 52% uh, are Pell Grant eligible. That means their income level is below a certain number. And 40.5% are first in their families to go to college. 23% are from underrepresented minority communities, etc. So Pali still cares for that. As we transform ourselves into School of Engineering, our goal is to maintain the tradition of bridging technology with society. In this modern world, we believe that it is very important. Uh, big data and cybersecurity is one important topic. It's clear that security, for example, has to be thought of in terms of privacy, and social sciences, which therefore impacts a whole lot of other departments within NYU, for instance, and a whole lot of disciplines in general. So you take almost any topic, for example, wireless, which is one of the areas in which we are trying to excel. Now, that has a lot of implications for uh, fields like uh, medical technology, for instance. So I take any topic of technology that uh, has been, uh, let's say, of importance to Pali, it has great connection and, uh, and uh, impact on other parts of the university in, in, in particular and, uh, and society at large. So this is our, um, our thought for the future. And for today's topic, who else are better suited than uh, Commissioner Brill and, of course, the distinguished panel that will follow them? So, uh, having said so much about um, about uh, Polly, I should say uh, something about them. But you're going to you're going to introduce them all, aren't you? Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, I think I will uh, um, not take more of your time. Um, already, Marilyn is telling me that I have one minute to go, so I should I should shut up and welcome you all to Polly and this event. Thank you very much. I should uh, mention to those here. Uh, at Pali and those uh, viewing uh, these events uh, and the uh, speakers, that if you have questions for the speaker, for uh, FTC Chair uh, <coughs> Commissioner Brill and to any members of the panel, uh, you see on the wall that you could submit questions during the event uh, by email to cyberlectureseries at poly.edu or you can tweet uh, at Cyber Lecture. Uh, you were given, as you walked in, one of these cards. Uh, those at home 
uh, and in their offices elsewhere in the world were not given this card. Uh, but uh, you'll see on the screen uh, even now uh, where you can um, send your questions. Uh, there's also, for those in the physical audience, uh, free Wi-Fi, and that's at Cyber Lecture. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the moderator of tonight's of this morning's event. Uh, our moderator this morning uh, is the Distinguished Scholar of Information Privacy, Catherine Strandberg. Surprisingly, Catherine earned her PhD in physics from Cornell and was a member of the notable Condensed Matter Theory Group at Argonne National Laboratory. However, she switched uh, her career and uh, she graduated with honors from the University of Chicago Law School and is, she is now of a distinguished Engelberg professor of law at NYU Law School. Please. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's sort of one of those trite things to say when you introduce someone that you're introducing a person who needs no introduction. Um, however, that is more, could not be more true than it is for uh, the, the uh, person that I'm about to introduce. Um, and so I'm going to be fairly brief because I'm sure you'd rather listen to her than to me, but um, there's uh, information in your uh, program, more information in your program. Um, I'm also going to wait to introduce our panelists until after the break when they will actually be sitting up here and you can, you can see them. So right now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished lecturer, Federal Trade Commissioner Julie Brill. Uh, Commissioner Brill works on a number of issues of importance to consumers and is particularly known to basically anyone who does anything in the information privacy area uh, as a, an important policymaker, thinker, and advocate on uh, the area of consumer privacy. Um, as I mentioned, her distinguished career is detailed in your program, and I'm not going to dwell on that now because uh, I want you to be able to listen to her. I am going to, however, mention my very favorite of her credentials, uh, which is that she received her JD from NYU School of Law um, and also was a recipient there of our Root Tilden Public Service Scholarships. Uh, so clearly, um, we can all uh, acknowledge that she has done both the law school and the Root Tilden scholarship in particular with this emphasis on public service proud in her career. And uh, we are always thrilled to have her back at NYU. Um, we love having her at the law school, and I love being able to come here to Brooklyn to um, welcome her here. So I won't say any more at this point. I'll just ask you to please join me in welcoming Commissioner Brill as this year's distinguished lecturer. Thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. And thank you, President Srinivasan, um, for your opening remarks. I'm really honored to be here, and I'd like to thank the Sloan Foundation and NYU Poly and Bob for sponsoring and hosting a wonderful event. <clears throat> Technology is transforming our lives. Its enormous benefits have become part of our daily routine. TripAdvisor plans our travel. Google Now keeps us on schedule. Birthdays are celebrated on Facebook. Our newborn's first pictures appear on Instagram. We discuss our medical conditions with WebMD. Google Maps, Twitter, and Foursquare know where we are. And Uber, City Bike, and MTA's Trip Planner know where we're going and how we are going to get there. These transformative online and mobile experiences collectively yield an enormous amount of data about us. Technology used by others reaps even more data every minute we walk the street, park our cars, or enter a building. When we go outside, <clears throat> ubiquitous CCTV and security cameras capture our movements. Our new cars will track us. Every time we go online or use a smartphone or credit card, our purchases and movements are tracked. In a real sense, we are becoming the sum of our digital parts. 
And that rich vein of data is exactly the gold that data miners want to extract. The estimates of the data we collectively generate are staggering. One estimate, already two years old, suggests that 1.8 trillion gigabytes of data were created in the year 2011 alone. That's the equivalent of every U.S. citizen writing three tweets per minute for almost 27,000 years. 90% of the world's data from the beginning of time until now has been generated over the past two years. And it is estimated that that total will double every two years from now on. Some suggest that this abundant data, this abundant data resource has become the new oil. Businesses are eager to drill to unlock the mysteries of disease, unblock our traffic jams, and solve industry's version of Freud's age-old question, what do consumers really want? Big data will have important, even transformative uses. But consumers, policymakers, and academics also see threats from these vast storehouses of data. This summer's revelations about the National Security Agency's vast data collection programs sound the alarm about the threat to privacy in a world where all one does is known and apparently is subject to government inspection. Most of us have been loath to examine too closely the price we pay by forfeiting control of our personal data in exchange for the convenience, ease of communication, and fun in a free-ranging and mostly free cyberspace. We do not need to pass judgment on the NSA's program to begin an overdue debate on how to balance national security against citizens' privacy rights. But I hope that the debate does not stop there. We need to have a similar debate in the commercial sphere as well, and the time to have it is now. The debate about big data brings the issues in the commercial sphere into sharp focus. No one questions the benefits big data analytics can bring from the utterly mundane helping companies determine which ads you see online, which articles a newspaper will recommend to you, and which book to suggest that you read, to the utterly transformative, keeping kids in high school, preventing infections in premature children, and conserving our natural resources by making our use of electricity more efficient. To reap these rewards, we're told we need to scrap many of the basic privacy, privacy principles. No more should companies worry about overcollection. No more should companies delete data. Data are the grist for their big analytic mill. And the more data, the better. Impose use restrictions instead. Consent, especially for secondary uses, out the window. Choice is inefficient and ineffective. And in any event, how can companies give notice and choice about unknown unanticipated uses of personal data to be discovered later through big analytics. <clears throat> Today, I'd like to answer these questions by presenting a different paradigm, a better paradigm. We can unlock the potential of big data and enjoy its benefits, but we can do so and still obey privacy principles that protect consumers. Now, I usually talk about these issues with industry leaders or policymakers in Washington, and I advocate for legal regimes and industry best practices that improve consumer privacy protections. But I've come to realize that we need more than law and more than best practices to safeguard privacy effectively. We also need new technological solutions to enhance consumer privacy. Which brings me to you. Many of you are engineering students and professors, company chief technology officers, and computer scientists. This is your technological revolution. But you understand that technology brings challenges too, and I believe that you are passionate about finding solutions. Policymakers like me and my FTC colleagues need to work hand in hand with you in the engineering and scientific communities. 
So this is your call to arms. Or perhaps, given who you are, your call to keyboard to help create technological solutions to some of the most vexing privacy problems presented by big data. Now, you're not going to be like Gary Cooper in High Noon, for those of you who remember that movie, fighting the outlaws all on your own. The world of big data is not quite the Wild West. We do have important rules in place governing the ways certain kinds of data can be used. One is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or FCRA. And it is the FCRA that presents the first set of challenges for technologists to address. The FCRA was our nation's first big data law. The seeds for it were planted in the aftermath of World War II. As the economy began to grow, businesses formed cooperatives to enable quicker and more accurate decisions about creditworthiness by sharing information about consumers who were, who were in default or delinquent on loans. Over time, these agencies combined and grew, paving the way for consumers across the nation to gain access to credit, insurance, and ultimately jobs. As credit bureaus increased their ability to draw inferences and make correlations through ever larger databases, unease about the amount of information that credit bureaus held, as well as its accuracy and its use, also increased. To respond to these concerns, in 1970, Congress passed the Fair Credit Reporting Act. FCRA governs the use of information to make decisions about consumer credit, insurance, employment, and housing. Entities collecting information from multiple sources and selling it to companies making these important decisions must ensure the information is as accurate as possible and used only for approved purposes. Not only does FCRA regulate the use of consumer data, it also gives consumers important rights. Consumers are entitled to access their data, challenge its accuracy, and be notified when they are denied credit or get a loan at less than favorable rates because of negative information in their files. My agency, the Federal Trade Commission, enforces the FCRA. Of course, we bring enforcement actions against traditional credit bureaus. Increasingly, though, we are focusing on data brokers that collect information about consumers from online and offline sources, including social media, and then develop and sell apps and other online services for employment and tenant, tenant screening, criminal background checks, and other activities plainly covered by FCRA. FCRA is not a panacea. The process of collecting data and synthesizing that data into profiles relating to individual consumers is too error prone for too many Americans. The FTC's recent study of the accuracy of credit reports found that, the rep that for one in 20 U.S. consumers, that means 10 million people in this country, the reports had serious errors that could result in them receiving less favorable credit than they deserve. We all know it can be a long, arduous, and extremely exasperating effort to correct a faulty credit report. Consider Julie Miller, an Oregon woman who spent years trying to correct her credit report and who recently obtained an $18.4 million judgment, and it was a punitive judgment, against one of the three major credit bureaus for indifference to her plight. The time has come for the credit reporting industry to address its error rate. The algorithms and processes used by the industry to assign data to a particular individual, the Oregon Julie Miller and not the Vermont Julie Miller, are in need of modernization. So too is the industry's dispute resolution system, which fails to resolve many disputes, especially where consumers have identical or similar names. New technological tools also must be developed to help consumers more easily obtain and understand their credit reports. 
and to give consumers a better privacy-enhancing interface for correcting their credit information across multiple credit bureaus. You can introduce this critical industry to 21st century techniques for responsible use of big data. You can modernize the credit reporting industry's algorithms and processes in a privacy protective way so that data about the financially responsible Julie Miller is no longer mixed up with data about her deadbeat doppelganger. You can re redesign the industry's dispute resolution systems so that disputes like hers are actually resolved and not just kicked down the road. And you can develop an intuitive platform for consumers to use to correct errors in their credit reports, thus helping ensure that their corrections flow in a privacy protective way to all major credit bureaus at once. The Internet of Things presents your second challenge. Interconnectivity is just around the corner. Connected cars will solve traffic congestions, Smart grid devices will conserve money and the environment. Smart refrigerators will tell you when you're running out of milk, and perhaps more importantly, beer. And connected medical devices will enable earlier detection and smarter treatments, saving lives. Yet the Internet of Things presents new challenges to consumer privacy. Many connected devices have no user interface, and consumers may not even realize that the device they are using is connected let alone sending data to third parties. All of this raises two key questions. First, without an interface, how can a company provide effective notice about the data it collects and how that data is used? And second, should society permit the data harvested from interconnected devices to be combined with other online and offline data, creating mega profiles that have very rich details about each of our behavior, including when we do our laundry, when we raid the fridge, and when we fail to turn out the lights. The engineers and technologists who design these devices and their systems of data collection will have to rise to the challenge of making sure that the Internet of Things respects consumer privacy. Last year, the Federal Trade Commission set forth a new general privacy framework for companies and policymakers that urges all companies handling consumer data to design privacy protections into their products and services, called Privacy by Design. We also urged companies to use simple, just-in-time privacy disclosures that would tell consumers how information is being collected and used, and give consumers the ability to either say no to the practices or to not engage in the transaction. You can design connected devices with these best practices in mind. You can ensure that these connected devices build in privacy from the start. Make sure that the device collects no more data than is necessary for the device's functioning and that the d data is held securely and for the minimum time necessary. And you can ensure that consumers are given simplified notice, even if the device has no interface, by creating a consumer-friendly online dashboard that explains through pictures, graphs, and other simple terms the data the device collects about consumers, the uses of the data, and who else might see the data. The smartphones and tablets we all carry, and soon the smart watches and connected glasses, create a ready canvas for immersive apps that will provide a new way of giving notice and consent that is more meaningful and less confusing for consumers. I've saved the toughest challenge for last, the vast amount of data collection and profiling that occurs by entities that are not consumer facing. These entities, called data brokers, merge vast amounts of online and offline information about consumers, turn this information into profiles, and market this information for purposes that may fall outside the FCRA. There are three categories of data broker practices that I'd like to focus on. First, 
there are those entities who are selling consumer-specific data for purposes that fall right on or just beyond the boundaries of FCRA and other laws. Take, for example, the newfangled lending institutions that forego traditional credit reports in favor of their own big data-driven analyses culled from social networks and other online sources. Or consider the eBureau, a company that prepares rankings of potential customers based on their occupation, salary, and home value, to spending on luxury goods or pet food, with algorithms that their creators say accurately predict spending. These e-scores are sold to determine the customers that are worth wooing on the web. It can be argued that e-scores don't yet fall under the FCRA because they're used for marketing and not for determinations on ultimate eligibility. But when financial institutions, banks, credit cards, uh, credit card issuers and debit card issuers and insurers send targeted ads to targeted consumers advertising certain rates that the institution will be willing to give the consumer based on the e-score, a consumer may never know that she is eligible for an even better rate. These ads are certainly the first cousin, if not closer, uh, if not closer kin, of firm offers of credit that are governed by the FCRA. Yet without FCRA protections, a consumer would not know if her e-score led to a higher loan rate or insurance premium, nor would she be able to access and correct any erroneous information about her. Second, there is another class of decisions increasingly based on big data, what the FTC has called eligibility determinations that could also, if founded on inaccurate information, do real harm to consumers. These include determinations about whether a consumer is too risky to do business with, has engaged in fraud, or is in ineligible to enroll in certain clubs, dating services, schools, or other programs. Though any of these decisions could deeply affect consumers, the data used and algorithms employed do not necessarily fall within the confines of the FCRA. Third, there is the collection and use of big data to make sensitive predictions about consumers, such as those involving sexual orientation, health condition, and religion. Let's look at the well-known, even at this point infamous, example of targets big data-driven campaign to identify pregnant consumers through analyses of consumers' purchases at its stores. This was Target's so-called pregnancy predictor score. Target was able to calculate not only whether a consumer was pregnant, but also when her baby was due. It used the information to win the expectant mom's loyalty by offering coupons tailored to her stage of pregnancy. Now, to be clear, I don't have any information indicating that Target sold its pregnancy predictor score or lists of pregnant customers to third parties. And I'm not suggesting that had Target done so, it would have violated the law. Yet, we can easily imagine a company that could develop algorithms that will predict other health conditions, diabetes, cancer, mental illness, based on information that by itself is innocuous, involving routine transactions, store purchases, web searches, and social media posts, and sell that information to marketers and others. <clears throat> and actually, you don't really have to imagine it. The Financial Times recently highlighted how some data brokers collect personal details so intimate they make Target's efforts seem tame. One firm called leadsplease.com reportedly sells the names, mailing addresses, and medical lists, and excuse, excuse me, medication lists of people with diseases like cancer and clinical depression. Another data broker, ALC Data, reportedly offers lists of consumers, their credit scores, and their specific ailments. Now, undoubtedly, Target provides some notice about how it collects and uses information to its online shoppers. 
but there's nothing in the context of a retail purchase that reasonably informs the consumer her data might be collected to make predictions about sensitive health conditions or seeks her consent to do so. And if the store were to, were to try to make the notice and consent explicit, imagine walking into Target and reading a sign on the wall or a disclosure on a receipt that says, we will analyze your purchases to predict what health conditions you may have so we can provide you with discounts and coupons you may want. That clear statement would surprise and alarm most of us. <clears throat> Big data advocates will point out <clears throat> that the FCRA governs the use of sensitive health data for certain purposes and will argue that if data brokers aren't employing health conditions, um, health condition predictions for one of these forbidden uses, then what's the harm? In fact, these advocates will say that predictive information about health conditions could help consumers reduce their risk of disease or control their symptoms, an end result that more than balances any breach of privacy. Now, this argument has some force in a hospital or medical trial or some other context where our, health, our federal health privacy law, which is known as HIPAA, applies. But when health information flows outside the protected HIPAA environment, I worry about three things. First, I worry about how sensitive health information can be used to make decisions about eligibility that fall outside the contours of FCRA without notice to the consumer or an opportunity to challenge the accuracy of the data used to make the decisions. Second, what happens if sensitive health information falls into the wrong hands through a data breach? And third, what damage is done to our sense of privacy and autonomy in a society in which information about one of the most sensitive aspects of our lives is available for analysts to examine without our knowledge or consent and for anyone to buy if they're willing to pay the going price? One way to solve this problem is to ensure that health data are truly de-identified. Of course, merely stripping identifiers, such as names and addresses, is not sufficient. It's too easy to re-identify data. But a standard that requires companies to make it impossible to re-identify data could make it effectively useless. The FTC has developed best practices around de-identification that strikes an appropriate balance by requiring companies to employ reasonable efforts to de-identify data, to publicly commit to use that data only in their de-identified form, and to impose legal requirements to make sure any downstream recipients um, of the data agree not to re-identify them. Now, you can join the core of computer scientists that continue to upgrade these de-identification techniques. But more robust de-identification will really not solve the problem of big data profiling. The entire big data enterprise, the big data profiling enterprise, is aimed at developing greater insight into the activities, the status, beliefs, and preferences of individuals. The data the industry employs are therefore about or linkable to individuals, or as one of the industry's trade associations just released report refers to it, individual level consumer data. Another solution offered to the challenges big data presents to privacy is the creation of the algorithmist, a licensed professional with ethical responsibilities for an organization's appropriate handling of consumer data. But the algorithmist will only thrive in a firm that thoroughly embraces privacy by design, from the engineers and the programmers all the way up to the C-suite, and understands that the use of algorithms to make decisions about individuals has legal and ethical implications. NYU Polytech and other top-notch engineering and computer science schools cover ethics in their courses, but the schools and profession should require more systematic ethical training for undergraduate and graduate degrees. Law schools do this, and believe me, you don't ever want to be accused of lagging behind lawyers in terms of ethical training. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
even if industry embraces privacy by design and we license all of you as a new cadre of algorithmists, we will not have met the fundamental challenge of big data in the marketplace, and that is consumers' loss of control over their most private and sensitive information. Changing the law would help. When I talk about these issues in Washington, I call on Congress to enact um, legislation that would require data brokers to provide notice, access, and correction rights to consumers, scaled to the sensitivity and use of the data at issue. Such a law would require data brokers to give consumers the ability to access their information and correct it when it is used for eligibility determinations, and the ability to opt out of information used for marketing. But together, we can begin to address consumers' loss of control over their most private and sensitive information even before legislation is enacted. I suggest we need a comprehensive initiative, one I am calling Reclaim Your Name. Reclaim Your Name would give consumers the knowledge and technological tools to assert some control over their personal data, to be the ones to, des to decide how much to share, with whom, and for what purpose to reclaim their names. And you, the engineers, computer scientists, and technologists, you can help industry develop this robust system for consumers. The concept is, is simple. Through creation of a consumer-friendly online service, cons uh, Reclaim Your Name would empower the consumer to find out how brokers are collecting and using data, give her access to information that data brokers have amassed about her, allow her to opt out if she learns a data broker is selling her information for marketing purposes, and provide her the opportunity to correct errors in information used for substantive decisions. Improving the handling of sensitive data is another part of Reclaim Your Name. Data brokers that participate in Reclaim Your Name would agree to tailor their data handling and notice and choice tools to the sensitivity of the information at issue. As the data they handle, are, uh, handle or create become more sensitive, relating to health conditions, sexual orientation, and financial condition, for example, the data brokers would provide greater transparency and more robust notice and choice to consumers. The user interface is also critical. It should be user friendly, and industry should provide a one-stop shop so consumers can learn about the tools all data brokers provide and the choices consumers can make about the use of their data. Now, some in industry responded quickly and positively to Reclaim Your Name. The nation's largest data broker, Axiom, has taken the first meaningful step by launching its web-based tool, which, it's call, which it calls About the Data. The website, aboutthedata.com, allows consumers to view portions of their marketing profile by seeing certain categories of information, like personal characteristics, home, vehicles, fin uh, household finances, including credit, purchases, and interests. Consumers can correct this information. And importantly, consumers can suppress any of the data they see. This is a valuable option. If you don't want to correct erroneous data, or you simply don't want things like your income, race, or marital status to be used in your marketing profile, you can tell Axiom to stop using it. Consumers can also opt out of Axiom's marketing profile system altogether. But there is still more work to do. Axiom's site provides some transparency but does it show consumers all the marketing information that's relevant? One reviewer reported that the current site leaves out many data elements that Axiom markets to its corporate clients. Moreover, though the option to, to suppress data is valuable, consumers would have trouble finding it. I did. Allowing consumers to suppress data more easily would be a welcome improvement. Consumers also should not mistake suppression or an opt-out for deletion or the end of data collection. Although Axiom will not use suppressed data for marketing purposes, 
the data will stay put. And perhaps most importantly, Axiom's consumer friendly about the data site currently only shows consumers their data for marketing purposes. Axiom holds many other data sets used for eligibility and other key decisions about consumers. Axiom should take similar steps to provide more transparency about these data sets as well. Still, I believe Axiom is on the right road. And you can work with Axiom to bring it further down this road and with other data brokers to help them take the first necessary steps. And then you can develop an industry-wide, one-stop shop to enable consumers to easily find out who the data brokers are and what choices they offer with respect to access, suppression, and correction of their data. <clears throat> My call to arms to technologists is not meant as an abdication of the responsibility that law enforcement, policymakers, Congress, industry, and other stakeholders have to address these issues. We all have a vital role to play. But it is important to recognize that you, the computer scientists, the engineers, the programmers, the technologists, have a unique set of skills that are key to solving these critical privacy issues. If you join me in this effort, I think that together we can help big data operate in a system that respects consumer privacy and engenders consumer trust allowing big data to reach its full potential to benefit us all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Uh, that's a challenge to us all, uh, to our society, uh, to those sitting here and watching on the internet and to our uh, representatives in Congress and our uh, leaders in Washington <clears throat> and throughout the country at the Attorney General's offices uh, at state level as well. These, that speech uh, and your challenge is an extraordinary step and uh, it comes from uh, the uh, noted uh, figure at the FTC, uh, who has been in the trenches at, of um, issues related to privacy. And now we're at uh, a critical moment in our history, and you've done a great job in laying out the landscape, and we're very grateful. We have 15 minutes now of a break. We come back, and uh, we will introduce our uh, panel. My name is Jake Miller, and I just graduated from the NYU Poly Cybersecurity Master's Program. The NYU Poly online program really suited my needs. I could sit down in front of a computer and take all of my courses, perform all of my coursework, and be able to do it without interrupting significantly my family life. The greatest benefit that I've experienced with this program is really the ability to connect with other people in my company. We really had a chance to bond together and we made a great team when it came to team projects. We could turn out a paper in three days that we were assigned two weeks to do, which was really nice and made me really proud. It really appeared like the professors um, took an interest in what was happening around them and made sure that we all knew about it and learned from it. I've been able to learn a lot of tips and tricks which I could then take and apply to my career. I would recommend the Poly Cohort Program to anyone. It will take your skills that you have already and really multiply them. It's an excellent program and I've had a lot of fun doing it. I think we're all stimulated enormously by this morning's lecture by Commissioner Brill. And uh, we will be uh, interrogating her as well as 
our distinguished panelists. Um, Professor Strandberg will uh, uh, give you an idea of who our panelists are, although if you have your program in front of you, you will see uh, their full biographies and uh, what role they will play here. Uh, I reintroduce you to Professor Strandberg, who will lead the discussion. But before I do, there are uh, just a little housekeeping that you will be hearing as we proceed. Professor Strandberg will uh, in open up the panel to questions. We will also interrupt some of those questions or, or the responses with additional questions from the audience. We already have three from either people sitting here or in the wider world, and uh, those questions will also be introduced as we proceed. Professor Strandberg. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, let me begin by um, introducing our really um, fabulous uh, panel. Um, let's see, I'll just start right here, right next to me. Uh, next to me is uh, Jennifer Glasgow, who is the Global Privacy and Public Policy Executive for Axiom Corporation. Um, so hopefully she'll be able to tell us a little bit more about their About the Data um, program. Um, there are many things, many uh, fabulous things in her biography. I'll just mention uh, that she's been recognized by the International Association of Privacy Professionals as the profession's first Chief Privacy Officer. Um, which is a very interesting, growing um, uh, career option, I guess you could say. Um, and she has served on numerous, numerous boards, councils, and committees um, nationally and internationally dedicated <coughs> to privacy issues. Um, next to her, of course, is Commissioner Brill, who we've already uh, has been introduced. And then next to uh, her is uh, Daniel Weitzner, who is the director of MIT's CSAIL Decentralized Information Group. Uh, before that, though, he has been the Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Internet Policy at the White House, and he has played a major role for many years in pri privacy advocacy as a founder of the Center for Democracy and Technology and Deputy Policy Director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And then last but not least is Julia Angwin, who is a technology journalist for the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm sure probably many of you um, have read uh, the results of her investigative reporting about privacy issues in, that, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that work has uh, made her a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in 2011 and led to a Gerald Loeb Award in 2010. Um, she has recently just finished writing a new book on online privacy. Um, which is entitled Dragnet Nation, A Quest for Privacy, Security, and Freedom in a World of Relentless Surveillance, and will be available um, in February, but it's not too soon to pre-order it on Amazon. <laughs> she told me I didn't have to say that, but I thought I should, because you should you. all read it. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, so with that, I want to um, get our discussion going. Um, I was actually going to start our discussion by asking the panelists for some thoughts on uh, Commissioner Brill's uh, discussion about the role of technologists, uh, privacy by design, professional ethics, and so forth. Uh, but I actually think I'm going to leave that topic a little bit um, in the hopes that perhaps some of you out there in the audience who actually are technologists, programmers, and so forth, um, might have some comments and questions on that subject to, uh, to send to us. Um, so we will, we will come back to that topic, um, hopefully with, with your help. Um, so where I actually do want to begin instead um, today uh, is with a focus on the issues about transparency that Commissioner Brill raised in her uh, lecture. Um, so just to, uh, to have the panelists think or just tell us what they think about how best to approach these transparency issues about both data collection and use. Um, clearly, the axiom about the data.com uh, pro uh, project, the reclaim your name proposal are uh, steps in that direction. Uh, those focus on transparency to individuals. So uh, one question I uh, have in mind is, um, is, is, this a, is this a workable focus? Is this the right way to focus on individuals? And if so, what information should consumers be given? 
Um, how can consumers be informed specifically about the purposes for which data is being used? Um, and secondly, I wanted to ask whether there, uh, we might think about having a different alternative or additional approach to data collection, uh, to transparency about data collection and use, um, directed toward regulators um, or toward um, uh, advocacy groups and so forth, something in the long lines of the um, SEC filings that companies do. So with that, I'll stop talking and turn to the panel and um, anyone who would like to be first to address the question. Um, any volunteers? Yeah, maybe volunteers? Sure. <laughs> <Jennifer>. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Uh, and I'd like to thank the uh, uh, Poly Institute, uh, our president here, Julie, and uh, Catherine Yu and, and Bob who put this program together for inviting me. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity and, and these are very important issues that uh, both Julie raised in her um, opening remarks and, and her talk. Uh, but I want to characterize them as none of them are easy issues with easy answers. Uh, and uh, as you said, I've been in this privacy profession for a good long while. Uh, and, the, and the choices and the challenges just get harder. So with that said, let me attempt to kind of maybe drill down specifically into this uh, concept of transparency. Uh, I think the real question, well, two questions that we have to, to try and answer. One is, what is the right way to achieve, what, what are the technology and other means to achieve transparency? And we've tried, you know, we have beat the issue of notices to death. Um, you know, notices in my opinion ought to be for the lawyers. Uh, and not for the consumers. Uh, and let's go ahead and let them write all they want and all the legalese they can, and if they're 127 pages, who cares? Because they will take the time to read them. <laughs> but we've got to figure out a different way to communicate what is important to consumers about big data analytics and how data flows through our um, economy. And I think that I will build on Ju Julie's comment about um, you know, calling on the technologists here because we need some really creative thoughts. Uh, but I think we have to also factor in, and this, I'm glad we're in an institution of education, uh, into this whole effort, the idea of how do people learn about this? Because I personally am not going to learn about it by going to people's websites and reading or going to other places and having to learn on my own. I need to be taught what are general common practices that go on uh, either in industry sectors or that are common across all kinds of, of processes so that then when I do get presented with a choice, I have some foundation for making an educated choices. Today consumers uh, are intimidated by the choices that they are given and they tend to not, I would say they don't opt. It doesn't matter whether it's opt in or opt out. Um, they do what, they, what requires the least amount of energy. So unless they're forced into accepting something, to get something, to enable the app, to sign on to something, uh, they don't opt. And so uh, that speaks to me that they don't understand the questions and the choices they're making. And if we give them more questions, what's going to make us think they're going to understand those any better? Thank you. Uh, thanks. And thanks also, let me uh, echo all the thanks to, to Polly, to Sloan, to Julie for being our leader here uh, in, in thinking about this, uh, this, these important issues. Uh, I, I want to talk about transparency by distinguishing transparency and accountability. Uh, I think transparency has a very important purpose in our privacy system in the United States, um, but it's a means, not an end. Um, and I, I really agree with Jennifer that I think the important means that, that transparency fulfills is it makes clear to regulators, to advocates, and maybe to the one-tenth of one percent of users who read these policies, what the commitments are that any given uh, uh, company is actually making. It's very important because almost everything that the FTC has been able to do, uh, as, as Julie I'm sure will elaborate, in, in the last 15 years on internet privacy has been based on enforcing deviations uh, uh, from companies' stated privacy policies. So it's very important that we have that kind of transparency. But we shouldn't, cons we shouldn't confuse that means with broader ends about privacy. I want to suggest that 
what we ought to care about as consumers and what we ought to think about as system designers uh, has more to do with accountability, has more to do with the question of, of what does it actually mean when, when data is actually being collected, what uses are that data actually being put to, and do we have tools that can actually help users uh, uh, understand when data is being used in a way they might not be happy about, when data is actually being collected in a way that they might not be happy about, uh, and, when, and when we can detect information misuse. The Fair Credit Reporting Act model that Commissioner Brill started us off with, I think remains in many ways the high water mark of U.S. privacy law. It focuses on situations in which consumers are actually being hurt and it provides consumers real remedies. It, it, it directs us, if you think about the, the enormous uh, amount of data activity that's going on, there's collection which is orders of magnitude more complex than the ultimate uses. From a simple engineering perspective, it makes a certain amount of sense to focus on the simpler end of that spectrum. Uh, where are bad things actually happening? This is what the FTC does when they go at enforce and try to hold companies accountable. They say, where are there things happening that are, that are actually creating problems uh, for consumers? Not just where do things feel weird or icky, <laughs> but, but, but where do things matter? We need tools to help identify that. And I'll just make, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, there's a whole kind of technical discussion that I hope we'll get into about what those tools might be. But I want to just point out that we have today, I think, an enormous privacy analysis gap. We have incredible tools <coughs> deployed by companies like Axiom, but also by, by loads and loads of other companies and loads of researchers for all kinds of reasons, analyzing data with extraordinary amount of power that we never would have imagined. Um, we're trying, and, and at the same time, the tools that we have to analyze privacy impact to analyze privacy misuse are, are minuscule compared to that. We're doing the equivalent of trying to play a chess game against IBM's Big Blue or whatever they call their newest computer with your iPhone. Uh, uh, and it won't work. Uh, we need to figure out how to, how to give consumers something like the analytic power to protect their privacy, to understand their privacy situation that the data analysis, uh, analysts have uh, on the other side. Um. So I think that is a great point. It's great to be here. Thanks for marketing my book for me and <laughs> uh, inviting me to talk. Um, I, you know, in, in the course of my book, I really, um, I've been writing investigative stories about privacy for years, and each one of these stories has sort of the same theme, which was like, oh my God, they're doing what? You know? <laughs> and so it was like, they're collecting where, and they're, do, they're tracking me here, they're tracking me there. And what I did in the book was I tried to figure out, well, what does it mean? What is it, why should we care? So I tried to protect my own privacy, and I took a lot of different steps. But one thing that I found really interesting is before I started trying to protect my privacy, I did an audit. I tried to see if I could get all my data. Where was it? Who had it? How could I get it? And so I made a list of 250 data brokers, and that took about three weeks to compile, I would just like to point out, and then um, found their privacy policies, figured out which ones would give me their data, and by the end, I really only got data from about 30. And, you know, so already, that's a trans. I mean, there are other gaps, like you're talking about, but that's a transparency gap, right? Because the thing that I found really interesting about it was that once I knew the data was there, I had this very crazy, visceral feeling like, I just want it, right? I just want it, and I think that's a lot of what people perceive as privacy issues, actually, is they want to see it. What's known about me? maybe I would learn something from it, right? There's this whole movement, the quantified self, but then we have to wear trackers. And in fact, somebody already has that data, right? And so I think there's also an element of that, which is people just want to see their data. I learned a lot from my data. I will point out to you that my Axiom data was not great. <laughs> so um, I learned, I had actually three separate Axiom experiences. One was I found, I went and looked at my cluster on this database called Personic X which said fortunes and families. And it said I was super educated, I had a picture of a Learjet, and I was really excited. <laughs> then, <laughs> I went to, then I actually sent in the $5. I would just like to point out they were the only one that charged $5 to get your data. And I got a form back with all the addresses I'd lived at. It was correct, it was fine, it wasn't very interesting. Then I went to About the Data, which you just launched, and I logged in, and I was like, what? I'm a single mother with a 17-year-old child? This is not actually true. And, um, and so I was, I w once again, transparency actually allowed me to be 
very, it was actually really illuminating. I was like, this is really interesting. There's three me's there. <laughs> There's probably 50 me's there. And I think that actually that a lot of the debate is also simply that. People just want to see it. They want to know. The thing that was interesting about the data is they were wrong about me having a 17-year-old child and being a single mother. But boy, were they right about my transactions. Oh my gosh, they were like, 54% of your transactions are online and 37% are in stores. And I, it was like scary. But then I was like, you know what, maybe I'm doing a little too much online shopping. <laughs> 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 maybe I've learned something from this. And so once again, I come back to this thing. It's like, I want the data because the data is valuable to me, right? So there's just a very simple baseline thing about transparency that I'm interested in. So on some level, you know, I also interacted with about the data. and found that mo most of my information was incorrect on, a, on every single level. And then the question became, what do you do about that as a consumer? And this, I think, harkens back to your point, Jennifer. It's like, wh how does the consumer deal with this? What, what amount of information do we do give to the consumer, and how many choices do we give to them that make sense in a real world? Um, I saw all these errors. I think it's said that I like bought three things online in the past 10 years, which is absolutely not true. Um, <laughs> had my income way too low, um, which shows the trajectory of my life. I guess it was old, <laughs> old uh, information. I think I'm the only commissioner whose salary actually went up when she came. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so everything was wrong. And so I, I'm a fairly highly educated consumer about these things. I've been dealing with um, data brokers and, and big data for a really long time. I started to correct it. And then I thought, well, wait, do I really want to correct it? Is this, who does this help to correct this information? So I, there is this very natural uh, inclination, the same one that Julia had. It's like you want it, you just want to see it, and then if it's wrong, you want it to become right. But I, knowing, you know, first of all, this was just marketing data. I knew that. I'm not sure many consumers understood that. I started to wonder whether this was really the right thing to do. But to, to, if I can just, I think Danny made some really excellent points. There was so much in there that's worthy of unpacking. Um, one of the things, though, that, that I talk a lot about is a lot of these disclosures will be incredibly helpful to, I think you called it the 1% of the 1% or whatever. You know, there's, there's a group of hackivists, consumer advocates, whatever we want to call them, people who are highly engaged on this issue, who frankly we depend upon a great deal um, just to give us at the FTC information about where we should go in terms of looking for potential problems. Similarly, Julia's articles and other media reports give us uh, information about where we want to go. So that's in, it's incredibly helpful to have that detailed disclosure about what is happening um, at a, at a, at a, with a lot of granularity. But for your average consumer, those kinds of disclosures, I think, are completely meaningless. We talk about simplified notice, just-in-time notice. But also, I think, to get to Danny's point, so much more needs to be put under the hood, right? We talk about the dashboard. We talk about giving consumers more choices. And I think you give them too many choices, and Jennifer's right, they won't opt because they're frozen. They just don't know what to do. And that's the reason why we talk about privacy by design and trying to put more under the hood. Uh, still, you need a dashboard. You need to give consumers the critical choices at an appropriate time. But privacy also needs to be built in by design. So did anybody else have a word? Um, I, I wanted to follow up on, on um, some of what um, I think Danny mostly said. Um, but to ask about the question about transparency, sort of transparency as to what. And it, it seems, it occurs to me at least, that one of the things about which we have very, very little information um, is exactly the question of, you might call it harm or um, consequences, et cetera. Um, to what extent are decisions being made that depend on data and I don't know what decisions are being made? Is this just about marketing or am I actually having, you know, are there, is there some other kind of effect? And I'm just curious to know um, what people think about sort of that end of transparency. Not so much the transparency about collection and maybe not even transparency about use, but transparency about what happened? Like, what are the consequences? What, if anything, should we be worried about? Anything? So it, it is interesting. Uh, again, coming, I, coming back to the Fair Credit Reporting Act as, as a, I think, an important guidepost, 
The Fair Credit Reporting Act focuses everyone's attention on the point when there's what's known as an adverse action. You know, you're denied a loan, you're denied a job, you're denied insurance. And then there is a clear, there's a clear problem for a consumer, and there's a possible mistake in the data by, you know, as, as Julia was suggesting, uh, there, there, was, there may be something wrong, or at least there's an opportunity to look and say, is there something wrong uh, uh, in, in your data? I think that w what I found very provocative about, about Commissioner Brill's kind of call to action here is, is, is to look at ways that we might extend that model um, from the very the traditional Fair Credit Reporting Act adverse actions to other kinds of adverse actions. Maybe you're not being offered uh, um, uh, options that you should be offered, purchasing options you should be offered. Maybe you're getting a different price for something than other people get. Now, I happen to think that there's a lot that could be done. Again, this is a technical challenge. Um, uh, you know, the amazing thing about the Internet as a marketplace is it's possible to see lots of pricing events all over the place. Um, I'd certainly be really interested when I see, you know, my kayak price for a flight from one place to another. I'd love to know what price all the other kayak users are actually paying. Uh, you know, what price did they pay last week? What price did they pay the following week? You know, there's a lot of transparency that actually I think can happen um, uh, based on opening up individual data um, and then giving the individuals the choice to share it, the choice to use it in ways that might be advantageous to them. So I think there, there is this whole spectrum from what are the kind of currently legally recognized harms. Um, at the other end, it's what I think are frankly nuisances, like, you know, maybe I got the wrong ad because someone thinks I, you know, like fly fishing. I don't care. Uh, that's their loss, not mine. But, but in the middle, there are a whole, the, these eligibility determinations, uh, I think there's a very interesting set of categories there that we should be able to know more about. And, and then I think if we have a more transparent uh, environment, we'll be able to start focusing on what are the things that, that have negative impact on consumers that the FTC should pay attention to mm -hmm. or that we should try to do things about. Mm -hmm. So on that point, you know, we did a, we, we've been trying in our reporting to really get to that question, right? Can we show the impact? Because it's very difficult. You can't take one little piece of data from Axiom and trace, I mean, we can, maybe you can, but trace it all the way through to like when you get some sort of price on kayak, right? Who knows where that came from? So, but we did do this survey at the end of 2012 where we did like try to find price differences online that were based on your personal characteristics. And we did find that people are starting to dip their toe in the water here. You know, Staples was customizing prices across the country. Everyone was getting different prices on staplers and electrical tape uh, based on their zip code. And we were able to prove that and, you know, I think that that is only the beginning, right? There's ultimately going to be more and more customization, just like your Google search results and my Google search results look different. Not that I use Google anymore, for, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I'm only on privacy protecting search engines these days. But, um, <laughs> you know, there's going to be, this, we're going to see different prices. And I worry about the transparency because the amount of work it took from a computer science perspective, it took us six, nine months to do that price study. And, by the way, what we did, I probably shouldn't say this with attorneys generals in the room, but what we did violates the CFAA for sure. I mean, it was exactly what we was in jail for, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is basically scraping public websites. But the law is vague enough that, like, this kind of counter surveillance could be criminalized, right? And I worry about that because that's, we're the watchdogs. You know, I want to be the watchdogs. That's my role. And um, so I would like to find better tools for seeing how these impacts are playing out. So, so this question of harm is very much at the center of much of the debate in Washington. Um, so, Kathy, just to get, you know, that notion that, um, you know, if we're going to do anything legislatively or through regulation, uh, congressmen very much want to know, and I think reasonably so, you know, what are the harms that they're trying to address? And I definitely agree with Danny that the FCRA presents a, a model that we, I believe, can build on and expand upon. One of the problems is, you know, the FCRA was written in 1970. I mean, Jennifer, did the internet exist in 1970? I didn't started know about in 1969, it. but it was kind of small. It was small. It was very small. Okay. Very, very small. Know about it. It's no. called the ARPANET. Uh, right. No one knew about it. No one knew about it. <laughs> Certainly, WebMD was not no. available to consumers to consult about their latest ailments. So, you know, um, the FCRA does present an interesting model that I think a lot of people are thinking about. My concern, and the FTC's concern, frankly, is that category of decisions that aren't 
employment, credit, <coughs> insurance, and housing, but are you going to be able to join a dating club? Are you going to be able to um, engage with a business, uh, you know, because so that they know who you are? Those sort of eligibility determinations, fraud determinations, are becoming used more. They're used more and more, mm -hmm. and consumers just don't have the ability to crack that nut at this point. And one of the other big, big problems around this, of course, um, in terms of harm, is just so many of these entities are not consumer facing. And consumers don't really know who they are and what information they, they are giving out. So one of the things that we're doing at the FTC, in addition to all the enforcement work we're doing, and I, I didn't really talk about that in my lecture, but as Danny alluded to, we do a tremendous amount of enforcement, not only in terms of deception, that is, what are people saying about their practices, but also in terms of unfairness. I mean, is there a practice that is just materially harmful to consumers that they can't avoid and that doesn't really have a countervailing benefit? Those are the kinds of things we look at to determine whether a practice, whatever a company says, is unfair. Um, but, but generally speaking, a lot more, I think, needs to be known about how this information is used and therefore to answer some of these questions about, well, what is the real harm? Julie Brill thinks there's a harm when health information is flowing around and people don't have control over it. But do others agree? Maybe some do, maybe some don't. We at the um, FTC, we're conducting um, a study of um, a number of data brokers to look at how this information is flowing and how it's being used, uh, both in terms of consumer, you know, decisions about consumers and otherwise. So I'm hoping that will help us get even further down the road with respect to this harm question. I identified three or four problems in my speech, but I think we really need to develop this issue much more. I'd just like to add on to this discussion because I, I agree with the, the points that have been made thus far. but. I think there's a vehicle here, and, and Julie's focus has been on um, what enforcement agency can do, and AGs and others, but I think uh, even the FTC has been encur very encouraging to industry to step forward, and before we have a law, Absolutely. or before we amend the FCRA, okay. to look at industry codes of conduct, Absolutely. and I think, and I'll, I'll criticize my own sector here in terms of industries, not just data brokers, but industry in general, has not done enough to establish new norms. Uh, the world is changing extremely fast. Uh, we have new kinds of data, new types, new ways to collect it um, every day, practically, that comes on the scene. And uh, if we're waiting on laws to uh, catch up to that, we are always going to be uh, maybe <laughs> years, if not decades, behind. So um, we really need, and the FTC has been very encouraging, even some of the legislation that's been introduced in recent years has encouraged um, mm -hmm. codes of conduct in industry developed that are jointly enforced, so they have teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is an underutilized uh, opportunity for us. Um, so let me just follow up on that because um, I'm really glad to hear everybody um, getting into this harm point because it's one that I'm personally like very, very concerned about. So I just want to push on it just a little bit more, a um, couple of different aspects of it. Um, so one is kind of um, following off on what, uh, what Jennifer just said, um, is to what extent do you think that one way to deal with um, this kind of decisional harm thing would be to import some type of procedural due process-like conception? I mean, I'm not talking about formal due process, obviously, but some sort of way in which the consumers are get to interact with decisions that are being made. Is that feasible, a good idea, bad idea or not. And then I'll just add one more, um, which is a question about whether we, uh, we ought to worry about potentially disparate impact of these harms onto particular groups of people who are either economically advantaged, racial groups, whatever, and whether, that, whether we think that might be a problem, and if so, whether that changes thinking about how to, how you might, how to handle the problem. So, anybody want to? Yeah. I'll start. Yeah, sure. um, and, and may I start with your second question sure. first? Uh, in terms of the disadvantaged, we have a footprint in 17 countries, and one of those countries is Brazil, which is we would consider an emerging economy in many ways, at least for certain segments of their population. And the question becomes, uh, to something as simple as a privacy policy, if the, uh, if, if the population is interacting, is buying on the Internet and doing things with um, cell phones or other uh, similar devices, but can't read, how do they make a choice? And it's a real problem. 
I mean, it, it's not a fair problem here in the U.S., but it is a real problem in certain places in the world. And so as technology is deployed to these underdeveloped uh, areas, we've got to think more creatively about how we educate, inform, and provide choice. And so it kind of goes back to my earlier point about too much. We've got to provide some big, broad education. You can't ask the consumer to figure it all out on their own. And just like the FTC has done with their um, uh, identity theft initiative and put a tremendous amount of, of public education mm -hmm. into the effort and mm -hmm. public sites about things to be careful about, whatever, I hope that we will, we will see that similar kind of uh, proactiveness from uh, all government agencies, mm -hmm. state AGs, mm -hmm. uh, FTC, any government agency, to warn about what are the things that people ought to think about. Well, it seems to me like the question is, um, when you're talking about these does different groups being treated differently, that is what big data is, essentially. I mean, data, big data is a way to take data that doesn't have associational characteristics and add association. So basically, you know, when I, Axiom, I sort of lo laugh that they think I'm a single mother with a 17-year-old kid and low income, but you know, when a, comp when a website buys that data, plops it into my cookie, and then all of a sudden when I show up on that website, all I see is, you know, basically kind of don't buy here, you're pretty much a shoplifter, <laughs> you know? I don't want that experience, right? And I think that we're not there yet, but this is sort of the coming harm that we're concerned about. And it was interesting when, our, when we did this price discrimination study about Staples. Um, the truth was Staples was customizing prices based on how close you lived to a competitor's store, like Office Max or Office Depot. So if you live near a competitor, they give you a lower price, which has sort of a rational basis, right? It makes a little bit of sense, you know, because theoretically you might just get up and go buy it there instead of ordering it from Staples online. Unfortunately, that also happens to be a higher income group of people so, who are getting lower prices, right? And so there was also just a second layer, which was totally inadvertent, but people with lower incomes and racial minorities were getting higher prices across the board. And that is going to happen all the time, right? And so in some ways, big data can, can actually sort of increase and solidify some of these income and disparities that some people feel are unfair and should be collapsed. Anybody else want to? More on that. Well, I've given my, you know, my proposal on Reclaim Your Name, I think, does, is designed to focus on some procedural due process rights. I mean, I don't know that it goes nearly to where you're talking about, mm -hmm. and I do think that those are important questions, and we do need to think about it for the reasons, you, you know, Julia's mentioning and, and others, but I, I think we need to give more tools to consumers. Now, I, um, like uh, Jennifer, am concerned about waiting for a law to be enacted. So, you know, or, or a constitution to be amended to think about this as, uh, you know, grounded in a legal basis is, is something that's important, but I don't want to wait. So I think we can build these tools and make them due process-like without waiting for the law to catch up. It will happen. You know, the, you know Martin Luther King Jr. said many, many wonderful things. And one of the things that he said that I think about a lot is, you know, the arc of history is long. Um, but it bends towards justice. I mean, eventually the law will catch up on these issues. But I think in the meantime, we, you, can all begin to develop the tools for consumers to put in place some of these due process kind of tools. Okay. So in my mind, the question is how to, and how to make sure that it bends in a timely in right, way in and right in an appropriate way, way based on what's actually happening. Right. Um, uh, sometimes our privacy law bends to sort of silly events that happen, like, you know, Judge Bork's video rental records were disclosed. Not a terrible privacy law, but arguably that's not really the data you want to determine uh, uh, policy progress. I think, I think um, uh, Catherine, the, the SEC model that you put, put out is, is, a, is a fascinating and important one, because if, if nothing else, what our securities laws in the U.S. I think try to do is to try to regulate on a scalable basis. In other words, um, people may not understand this, but uh, you know, publicly traded companies have to file all kinds of information with, uh, uh, with the Security and Exchange Commission. The Security and Exchange Commission does not read anything. 
that more or less uh, that get that that, that 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 gets filed. I mean, there's literally you know reams and reams and reams, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of data that just sits there, and you think, well, that's dumb. We um, read it <laughs> exactly. Hey, thank that's, you. That, I read that. that. Right, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Reporters read it. Uh, 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 the selected stockholders read it. <laughs> Probably most importantly, uh, lawyers who think they may be able to go find companies to sue because they've been behaving improperly read them. And so, so again, it's a situation, and I hate to keep harping on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, but it's, a, it's an example of a scalable regulatory model that helps us to focus on where there are problems that we need to, to identify and, and, and act on and put pressure on. But the important thing is, in the case of securities law, we're talking about money. You know, we're talking about whether this very quantifiable thing is flowing mm -hmm. in an appropriate way. What we really lack, I think, in the privacy realm is a similar kind of accountability metric. We have these goofy, gobbledygook mm -hmm. privacy policies that, uh, you know, do have their purpose but really don't from any kind of empirical perspective amount to a, 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 a thing that you could measure against. Um, uh, uh, there's no currency. There's no, right. There, there, there is no currency, and it's very simple. People say, oh, well, the personal data is the oil of the new economy. Well, that is total hogwash. It doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> um, because oil, you know, oil burns at a certain rate, and you could say, well, this is high quality oil or low quality oil, and you could decide what to pay for it. Now, there are measures uh, of, of, of the value of personal data, but they aren't really measures of the privacy impact of the use of personal data. Mm -hmm. We've started, uh, uh, there are a number of my colleagues around the world are st have, have been working for a couple of years on what we call accountable systems, way to f ways to formalize in, in computer systems uh, um, uh, what legal rules are and try to, to, to be able to map those legal rules to actual information flows and make assessments, empirical quantitative assessments of whether rules are being followed or not. Um, not unlike the accounting systems that we use to keep our economy going. We couldn't keep track of our economy by you know, sending all the information about all the, 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 the public and private companies to a big government agency or to the FTC and saying, is everything okay? It would overwhelm the FTC, it would overwhelm the FCC, but we have this way of measuring things using accounting rules to make sure that the money's going in the right place. And when and, and, it, and, and, and when it's not going in the right place, we have a bunch of things we do because we can, we can detect the anomalies. Mm -hmm. We need the same kind of thing uh, for data. Right. We need account, an accounting system? We need an accounting system oh, for wow. data. But, okay. it's, but it's not just data, <laughs> it's the privacy impact that's, of data. That's exactly that, right. So yeah. it's so, and that's when I said we don't have a currency, we really don't have a, I meant there's no tool to that's measure right. that. That's right. That's right. Wait, but the problem is every time that any kind of measurement system comes out. I mean, all these outdated laws, they were actually attempting to measure the privacy impact in some way of data at that time. And their assessments were are outdated, right? So the problem with putting these assessments in is that location data wasn't even available. Its value right. changes right. depending right. on how much of it you right. have, right? I, I don't want to throw cold water too no, much no, on no. this, but I, I feel like what you, what you see with the history of privacy laws is very strict sort of compartmentalization of data. Yeah. These things are bad, right? And don't do them or whatever. And then just, it's like rocks in a river. Just everything flows around them. Like just, it just doesn't even matter, right? The other data takes the place and replaces so them. So I don't, I don't think it's that everything flows around them. I think it's that there's a lot more water in the stream now. I mean, in, in, in 1970, mm -hmm. the three credit reporting agencies that were subject to the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the relatively small, you know, the, the much smaller economy that was built around that was, I think, arguably pretty effectively regulated by that, that law. But, of course, we're doing a whole lot more yeah. with data now, some of which, again, I think is in, the, is in the realm of nuisance and we don't need to worry too much about it. But a lot of it is in this middle realm that, that Julie identified, that there, there are uses right. that do have negative consumer impact and we need to be able to detect them and, and understand them. And I think the reality is law can only evolve based on experience of things that we don't like happening in society. In other words, we can't, we can't sit here and kind of just say, well, let's invent the, the next law. We have to do it based on, you know, what's creating problems. And as, as you know, we can talk about 
the dysfunction of Congress uh, easily, but um, <laughs> and, and I think you know in many ways Jennifer is correct that that a lot of this we would want to start with with industry codes of conduct with you know responsible practices that hopefully can propagate um, and and then I would argue eventually become law and eventually become formalized, um, but but I think we have to know what we're talking about. Uh, the old management adage: you can't manage what you can't. Uh, uh, quantify. You know, um, we're, we're talking about trying to make rules for a highly kind of technical mechanism, really, of all this data analysis, and we don't have a formal way of describing the impact mm -hmm. of the mechanism. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the answers are not straightforward or simple. And as more data gets pumped into the stream, <clears throat> the complexity of solving that issue gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it, it's easy to say, what can I do about something like, you know, uh, one specific practice, do not call to go to a another, great Another thing that we, that we enforce, right. yes. Uh, because that's a very discreet set of practices, and it's a very discreet set of data that is used in those practices. So you can write a set of, of guidelines, if you will, for that. You have to evolve it over time. I, I think, you know, if there's anything I hope we've learned um, from the FCRA model and others is that uh, you can't get too specific with the solution. <laughs> it's more about talking about the problem and what, what kind of conditions do I put on addressing the problem than predicting a solution. And, and I think FCRA is, you know, the fact that it was enacted in 1970 and we modified it in the 90s a couple of times mm -hmm. is an example that, that is not uh, referenced or held up enough. Now, interestingly enough, Danny, and you probably I've been around a little bit longer in this field than you have. There were th 3,000 credit bureaus when FCRI was enacted. Huh. Yeah, I was going to say there are a lot. We have three, three big ones. Three big ones, right. A yes. lot of uh -huh. big ones, yeah, yeah. We have three today. And so I think it speaks right. to the fact that as a highly regulated activity, hmm. uh, the burden of regulation does have a market effect hmm. um, on the providers of those services. Now, we can argue whether that's good or bad, uh, but uh, <laughs> when you say, so, we need, it is, are we in the, the mode today in the data broker community where we've got 3,000 of us? Because I suspect we've actually got more than that if you really you know, analyze the number. Uh, what yeah. will... I, I what, severely undercounted, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Jill. That's all we should find. You should have asked us for the list. Uh, or anyway. Uh, and you would have given, uh, it, no. you would have given <laughs> us the list? <laughs> we might have pointed to you in some directions to look. But, um, <laughs> Anyway. Next book. <laughs> next book. Next book. Uh, okay, I want to I want to turn to one of our uh, audience questions um, right now, which is related to this issue of transparency. Um, uh, the question was, uh, can we hear more about the balance between accurate attribution and de-identification, or I think really the tension <laughs> between um, accurate having accurate information for making all these decisions and so forth, and the concerns about um, de-identification. So how should we think about those? Are they things that act, act in different spheres, or is there a real tension? Well, so, um, you know, I, I tried to address that a little bit in my talk. I think, you know, generally speaking, we like, uh, we at the FTC, uh, very much encourage de-identification as much as possible. And I think, generally speaking, the data protection authorities around the globe encourage de-identification as much as possible. And there are many, many big data projects, big data research projects that could, I believe, easily function or almost as easily function with robustly de-identified data. And the other aspect of de-identification that I talked a little bit about in, in my talk is there are technological solutions for de-identification, you know, stripping out identifiers and whatnot, but I believe and, I, and the Federal Trade Commission believed when we wrote our report in 2012 that that's not enough, sort of turning on its head what my, the whole theme of my talk was about, which is laws are great, but we need you to kick in gear, you the technologist. Here, technology is great, but it isn't quite there for perfect de-identification yet. There are all these studies about re-identifying supposedly de-identified data. So what we need coupled with de-identification technology are social norms about promises that if you're going to use de uh, 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 identifiable data, you're going to de-identify it and you're going to claim, look, this is going to be a de-identified project, you have to promise that you're not going to re-identify it. And you've got to promise that anyone you provide that data to 
will agree to not re-identify it. So we need some social norms around de-identification. So there's a whole group of projects that I think, big data projects, where I think this will work really well, including some medical research, including transportation, including some of the really transformative uses of big data that everybody talks to as its biggest promise. But when it comes to profiling individuals, you know, de-identification is anathema to that. You can, you can, um, the, the, the phrase that people are using now is pseudonymization. You know, let's try to get rid of name and address, let's get rid of other identifiers, but we will link, you know, uh, person 1234 and that cookie 1234 or the fingerprinting of their, ma their device or their MAC address or whatever, we will follow that identifier around. And that's considered pseudonymized data. But from our perspective, the Federal Trade Commission's perspective, back in 2012, we said linkable data, data that is linkable to an individual is personally identifiable. And that's a concept that actually we picked up in our um, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. We haven't gotten into that. I don't know that it's worthwhile getting into that. Uh, talk about walled gardens, you know, the way children are treated online through COPPA is essentially a walled garden. Um, but, but we do talk about this notion of linkable uh, uh, data. So, so you know, I, I, the question is, is a provocative one. I mean, there is a tension here. I think when it comes to um, putting those questions into the big data context, what you need to look at is what is the project at issue? What's the purpose of the big data project? And then determine which direction you can go. Unfortunately, from my perspective, so much of profiling, so much of what Jennifer's business is about is focused on individuals. And I don't, de-identification doesn't work there. And, and then, and then the, the effect it has on data breaches, to the extent that this information is not uh, de-identified and, and unlinked and all that, then just becomes uh, even, even greater. So, so I think there's a very direct tension between de-identification, which I do think has some value, and the kind of concerns about discrimination that Julia's raised. Uh, if we want, on the one hand, to know that, uh, you know, if I want to know why I'm a, a, you know, a poor Hispanic person and I'm getting certain ads with certain prices, um, I can imagine designing a system and, and putting in place a set of requirements that makes sure that there's a link between the ad I get and, and, and the demographic information about me that, that, that caused that ad to happen. But if you, if, you, if you take away too much of the personal information about me in that process by de-identifying, you're actually going to have a harder time uh, making the connection between the, the person's data which either accurately or inaccurately, fairly or unfairly, created the profile. I, I want to say another thing about, about de-identification. You know, there's, there's, every once in a while there are these kind of um, purported technical silver bullets that come along in the, the, the privacy debate, and they generally have to do with some version of, of cryptographic technology. You can kind of scramble things up in some way and hide certain data and keep other data exposed and it all feels like it'll be magic and everyone will be happy. Um, uh, the, the problem in de-identification is there is a, there's a very direct trade-off between how useful information is mm -hmm. and how identified it is. Uh, so de-identification is a technique that's been used for decades uh, by the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau wants to make available certain aggregate information about the population. And they actually have been very, very careful to make sure that that doesn't reveal people's identities because they're very, very cautious about making sure that, that people uh, uh, trust the census, that they'll continue to answer census questions. Um, we're in a complete de-identification arms race at the moment. Uh, uh, where all of my colleagues who are cryptographers and other kind of smart computer scientists are finding more and more and more ways to break de-identification techniques and re-identify data. Okay. Uh, uh, the first person to do this in, in kind of recent memory was uh, uh, Professor Latanya Sweeney, whose thesis committee I was on at MIT. She re-identified uh, Governor William Weld's medical records uh, uh, from, from, from public health data that was released, and, and which I think lots of people would agree, it's very important to release public health data so that you can, uh, you know, make sure that you track uh, uh, infectious disease trends, other kinds of health trends, uh, but it has, it has downsides. Um, uh, we now have a bunch of formal characterizations of, of how good de-identification technology is. Um, 
Uh, this goes under the name of differential privacy. Um, but I think this is still pretty, it is still untested. It is, in fact, untested technology. And um, uh, we've really yet to see it, it, it deployed uh, at, at, at large scale. I think it has some promise for research applications. Uh, I think it's not probably going to be all that useful for the, the kind of commercial privacy applications that, yes. that, that, that give rise to most of the privacy concerns that the FTC Which is why you need to couple it with those social Yes, norms. yes, um, with, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'll, I'll just build on what Danny's saying. As a practical person that has to implement these things in a company, we just take the position that de-identified data, even if you can figure out how to de-identify it effectively today, is not going to be de-identifiable at some point in the rel relatively near future, okay? I mean, that's how fast it's all moving. So with that in mind, I think we need, as opposed, while it's great to do these kind of things, and I think they have some ap applicability, I agree they're not generally applicable in a commercial sense. We've got to figure, and I think the FTC went down a good path, maybe not, maybe there's more to do in terms of saying, well, you've got to make promises that are enforceable, you've got to Mm -hmm. uh, pass his commitments on mm -hmm. via contracts and so on. So what we're beginning to do is, is bifurcate the world of public research where we are publishing data out for anyone to get to from the uh, world where, we, where I can control who I'm giving it to and for what purpose they're going to use it for and pass commitments onto it. It may be that we end up with uh, a research field uh, dealing with big data that has to have some professional ethics so that uh, we can trust them to not do things they, you know, they are asked not to do. Now that doesn't give us certainties like technical, the technical solution do, but I think it begins to build layers of protection on top of this that, are, uh, that we should be exploring. Mm -hmm. I just want to add one note about the census because everybody talks about the census as this incredibly innocuous data set, de-identified, you know, super friendly people coming to ask you questions. But the truth is census data has been abused many times in this country and many times across the world. And, you know, I'm sure you all know, but I'll just remind you, so, you know, it was used to locate Japanese citizens and put them in camps during World War II. It was used after 9-11 to locate Arab American populations where the FBI then targeted them for surveillance. And every time the census guys say, oh, I'm sorry, that was a mistake, Oops, you know, well, actually it took them actually until 2000 to apologize for the Japanese one. But um, the, the thing is, and that's just the U.S., so we have very good laws, right? In Rwanda and other places, census data has been used for terrible purposes. And it goes to this question, which is data, humans are flawed, and data is something that humans can abuse, right? So you have to also just see all data kind of as radioactive waste. Like somebody's gonna find a way to abuse this, right? Somebody at the NSA is logging in and they've got their love inch, right? Like, like the, I don't know if you all saw the story that there was like, they have a name for this when you, when you try to track your spouse's phone calls in the NSA database, they call it love intelligence. And yeah, yeah, this happens. And then they get caught and it's, they say sorry and then they move on. But that's what happens to data. It gets abused. So I, I, I wanna, I, I think that that is true. It is true that most things that we have laws about um, are not susceptible to perfect enforcement. We have laws against murder and people still kill people. We have laws against fraud and there's still you know, billions of dollars lost. We have laws against you know, using ATM machines improperly and I don't know what the last number was. I mean tens of billions of dollars just disappear from ATM machines around the world you know, on a daily basis. And you know, um, so yeah, so, so, so the, the choice is um, there is kind of the, 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 the implication of the radioactive uh, uh, characterization is, you know, try to put it all in, what is that mountain in? Uh, Yucca uh, Mountain. The, put it all in Yucca Mountain. Like, put it all there. I guess that's the NSA's idea, right? They're trying yes. to put it all there. Right? You know, keep it all in one place um, and, and hope nothing bad happens. Um, uh, I think that your point about the, the, the flaws in human nature suggests, to some extent, regardless of what we do, bad things will happen. Um, that's why I think that accountability measures, uh, uh, getting better at keeping track of who's messing with data, of who's doing bad things with data, is really what's important. I do not believe it's the case that we would have had no Japanese internment if we had no census. I do not believe it's the case that we would have had no Holocaust if, if the Germans didn't have the old IBM right. Hollerith machines that could keep track of Jews. Uh, um, uh, I think they would have figured out how to do it anyway. And I do think there's a very, very deep kind of divide in how we think about law and governance about 
when we favor transparency and when we favor uh, kind of secrecy and elimination of data. And I'm, I'm, I'm playing on, I know how much you hate secrecy, so I'm baiting you. But I think that that's, that is, in a lot of ways, the choice that we have in this big data world where we, we do have a lot of, what, you know, whether you call it radioactive waste or oil or you know, <laughs> somewhere in between, we have it. It's, 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 sludge. it's out of sludge. sludge. <laughs> right. Uh, or, right. Or the, you know, it eventually gets turned into sludge. So, so you know, I think what, whenever we decide to use data for any purpose that could be harmful, we better understand how to keep track of those harms. We better understand how to keep track of the fact that there may be census workers who are, who are wrong. Or there may be FBI agents who go and knock on the census's door uh, with effectively a gun to their head and say, you better give us that data because that's what happened, not the gun. But, yeah. uh, uh, you know, so, so we better understand how to, how to, how to, how to identify and, and detect misuses of data because we know it's going to happen. Right. I just want to make one point. Sorry, he's baiting. Me, so, I have to. so I think that is totally, you're completely right. Obviously, all these harms would happen. People are bad regardless of data. But the one thing that you're missing there is there's no law right now about use of data. I, I, so yes, I agree. You yes, guys are all I very agree. reluctant to sort of talk, call for laws. No, I know you're no, 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 no. no, no, no. I'm reluctant in the least. I just, I just want to be realistic about right. the possibilities of, of it being. Right. So I would like to be unrealistic and just say, like, w could we have some basic laws about we what's should have better data privacy. Use. We should have better <laughs> privacy law in the United States. We, sh we should okay. have baseline. <laughs> President Obama <laughs> said it in 2012. We need a consumer privacy yeah. protection law. We absolutely do. Okay. So let's want to make sure that, like, that we also acknowledge that. Let me, <laughs> I'd like to add just one other kind of uh, additional point to the discussion that's been going on thus far, and that is part of the accountability activity, or maybe in addition to it, it depends on what uh, theory of accountability you apply. Uh, but I think it's totally underplayed is that we do not have enough recourse or redress. And Julie, you mentioned in your uh, talk that you know that some, it's too difficult when there is a problem. And I agree with Danny. There's going to be problems. We can't avoid them. Locking down the data or not collecting it is not the solution to de dealing with the problems. But when there is an issue, when someone has been disadvantaged, when they didn't get a fair price, but whatever the harm is that's happened. We have not, as a community, focused enough on what are my remedies? What can I do about it? Mm -hmm. How do I make myself, if not completely whole, at least somewhat get back to something that's, that's reasonable? And what kind of effort and energy do I have to put into that? And I think that's a huge opportunity, missed opportunity. We spend a lot of time within our company dealing with consumers and trying to help them help solve those problems when they come to us with their problems. And it's, it's interesting that it, it's not easy. It takes time. Um, it takes people doing research to figure out, well, how did either it's an error in the data or in some of our identity verification applications, they didn't get, a, they didn't get verified, so why? Um, what do I do to fix this so next time I am trying to, to uh, be verified, I don't run into this problem? Uh, but we see it in government. Uh, we see it everywhere that we always think about recourse. After the fact, let's get it up, let's get it running, let's figure out what the problems are, and then we'll figure out how to fix them. Well, I guarantee we can predict some of those problems in the design phase, so maybe add to your challenge to this audience mm -hmm. to be thinking about what is the remedy in the system to dealing with a problem that does arise and we've identified. I, I want to just put a finer point on the environmental analogy, because I think it's really important. I think that when you think about, uh, there are a lot of people who, uh, I think rightly, look at the environmental movement and the environmental regulations that we have, kind of which ones work, which ones don't, the sense in which they were obviously enormous social progress um, after, you know, centuries of abuse. Um, and then and the question is, what's the analogy with data? What's the analogy with, with personal data? To me, the analogy to radioactivity is misuse of data. It, because, the, or the analogy to you know, carbon emissions is misuse of data. The carbon emissions are byproducts of activity that we all think is at some level or another desirable and socially valuable. And so we don't, we don't, we don't structure our environmental regulations by saying stop driving. Uh, we say you have to have higher fuel efficiency standards. We say you have to, you know, 
you have to collect your carbon. You have, you know, you, you, do, you do one or another thing. Um, uh, but m I think even more importantly than that, we've, we've been able to have viable environmental regulations because we can quantify environmental harm. We can say, you are allowed to dump so many tons of carbon into the air, but after that, it's a crime. <laughs> and it's made feel kind of gross that we dump those first tons of carbon into the, into the atmosphere, but we do that because we recognize it as a byproduct of other things we want to do. Um, and so I, I, I think that to get to the point of a mature regulatory process where the interests that we have are actually protected, Again, we've got to be able to do a better job of quantifying. I think this is your point about the fact that we need a law. I think we do need social and legal recognition of what harms we're trying to actually limit. And yeah, but the problem is we're not, we're not going to have a good, I don't believe we will, in the near future, have a good measure for something like disclosure that someone has cancer. You know, that someone's been, someone's been profiled based on purchases or whatever, and they are put in a bucket of, of they have cancer, or, they're, or maybe even worse, they're likely to get cancer right. because of their various genetic disposals or whatever, and or predispositions or whatever. And then where that information goes could be exceedingly troubling. So how do you measure that? How do you measure, just before, before we even talk about, well, could they lose a job, could they yeah. lose a loan, might they be charged a higher rate, all that. Yeah. Just the fact that someone has through innocuous purchases at a bunch of stores, been determined to either have cancer or be someone who will be getting cancer. Is, is this, a, is this what the kind of information that we want flowing in our society? I mean, the externalities, if you really want to go to the environmental analogy. I mean, one of the big problems with environmental regulation was it was all based on externalities, right? It was very hard to place the burden on the polluter the harm that was being caused to society at large. That's the externality right. problem. Here, in some ways, it's almost like an internality. The, the harm is so individualized, right? There's, there's no way to quantify it, except if that's your information, that's your internality, you're devastated that people either know this or have figured this out. Maybe you want the information. Maybe some people want to know, hey, you're, they're likely to get cancer. Maybe they'll, they'll do something with that. But for many people, that would be devastating. Yeah. But, you know, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually interject to <laughs> okay. We are going to run out of time. And I know we, we can go, go on all day. On all day. <laughs> um, but actually, this is kind of going in the direction I wanted to um, push us anyway. So I just want to like, frame it a little bit. But, uh, and I want to ask one of our audience questions. Um, so so I, think it's, I think this is a perfect time to start talking about legislation and sort of mm -hmm. what should be done, what are, what are the options. And I'll just, I'll just start that out with the question uh, from an audience member, um, which also relates to these harm questions. Uh, is one way to go to try to have some sort of expiration date on personal data? Or you could say uh, data destruction or anti-data retention or something. Is that a, a viable regulatory approach? Um, and then once we talk about that, we'll start talking about some other possible regulatory approaches? Well, the truth is what I hear from many uh, marketers is that uh, only a certain amount of uh, data does have a natural expiration date. That's what I hear. I'll be very interested to hear Jennifer respond to this. Because if that were the case, you would think that data deletion, um, an expiration date, would be sort of easy to implement. During the course of discussions around um, do not track, and uh, it, within the W3C, the, this issue became a, a huge hot button. Um, marketers did not want to have sort of a, a deletion time period. And it, there became a, a big debate over should it be seven years, should it be you know, one year, should there be no time limit. And of course, in the, big, in the many big data projects, you'd hear researchers say, well, if you del start deleting data, I might figure out a great use for it you know, five years from now. So I think for marketing purposes, generally people think that you, know, you kind of do need fresh data, yet whenever there's been discussions about trying to have these kind of time limitations, there's been a lot of pushback. So I'd be really interested to hear what you think about freshness of data and expiration dates. Uh, I think we run the risk of lumping all data together into one bucket. Uh, and that's why, as I said earlier, this is not, there are no easy answers to these issues. Uh, data retention, I think, can play a role, but I think it's, it may be oversold as, as a solution that really isn't going to have much effect. Uh, and let me give you some examples. If I have a date of birth on someone, that's good for life. 
Yeah, right. You could, okay. If I think someone is in market for a new car, that may be good for three months because they're going to buy the car and then they're out of market. So I think the challenge we've got is generalizing. Uh, even something as narrow as marketing is still, there's still a wide variety of things. You know, uh, activities that people engage in. Uh, you like to play golf. You like to play tennis. You can play golf or tennis for 20, 30 years. So, you know, would you say, well, you should delete that after seven years unless I can reconfirm it? Well, the market would prefer it be reconfirmed because they'd like for it to be more accurate. But would you legislate that? I don't know. Now, if there is certain data, and I would say probably it would not be used for marketing, that is being used for eligibility mm -hmm. or, other, or health or other things, sensitive categories, maybe it has some applic uh, applicability there. But I think it ties to some degree to who the holder is and what they're going to be doing with it. Because research, even medical research over time, depends quite often on lots of history of data to see if those diseases are, are, are changing. Uh, they're, they're, you know, flu trends, take a simple one. I mean, we've got decades of flu trends. So maybe it needs to be de-identified to be used or um, in a state that's, that it's not as personal and not as offensive, but I, I, it seems like kind of a simple solution when in reality I don't think it solves much of the overall concerns that we've got. So, so let's now let's talk about well, how do we solve these concerns. Um, and I was thinking about kind of the different ways to possibly get at this question. Um, so we have 10 minutes left. Um, so maybe let's see people's reactions to putting it this way, and it might not work, but I think we've had three sort of basic paradigms for how to approach these questions that have been discussed today. One is legislation. The other one is uh, industry, best practices, self-regulation. And the other was the some sort of ethical responsibilities or, or ethical requirements, um, you know, which might be backed up by law, as it is, say, for lawyers. So I guess the question I wanted to ask you all to think about is, given these sort of three, and maybe there are others, but three paradigms, um, which of these do you think will work you know, for what? Or which is the most promising in what kinds of areas? And maybe this is a kind of way we can try to sum up a little bit with, uh, with our discussion. I mean, maybe I'll start with that. I mean, I think the environmental comparison is actually a good one, which is that in cleaning up the environment, it was everything that worked, right? It wasn't just, it was technology for better pollution controls. It was laws. It was radical transparency. It was social norms of people picking up dog poop. I mean, who would have ever thought that a woman in Central Park wearing a fur coat would bend over and pick up her dog poop? Like 50 years ago, you would have knocked anyone over with a feather, right? So social norms can change. So everything has to happen. One thing that I just want to throw a cautionary note about is technology, although I grew up in technology. I'm a technology reporter. I learned to code in fifth grade. I love technology. The one thing I have learned through my own privacy journey of this past year of trying to protect my own privacy is that it's just an arms race, right? So I get more encrypted and I stop using Google and I start, I'm, I'm, you know, gotten to this level of complete insanity, but there's always someone circumventing me. And so the arms race alone, although I really want obviously the best tools for myself and I'm happy when technologists come to them, it's just not enough. I mean, that race is, there's, I'm underfunded in that race as, a, as an individual civilian, right? And so I just don't see how I'm going to get the firepower that I need to win that on that front. So I guess I, I'd want, I, I really agree with Julia, it's got to be all of the above. I, I, I would emphasize two of the above it, on the policy side. I think there's a whole lot of technology development that still is very important. Um, but I think that, and I'm really just echoing the, the privacy policy position from the Obama administration, that, that I do think we need um, more of a baseline of privacy protection that individuals can rely on. Uh, I think that we actually have lots of good privacy laws in the U.S. We have, we have 
some of them need a little attention. I think our health privacy law could be updated a little bit. Uh, but we have financial privacy laws. We have great uh, genetic information privacy laws. Yeah, we have, we have the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, but we have this big gap, um, uh, which frankly covers a lot of the data that Jennifer's company has and, and you know, that, that, that a lot of the data brokers have. And, and I think that um, we, there is, I think, a, an evolving understanding of what good privacy practices are and what bad privacy practices are. There is a set of principles that I think people do understand um, uh, about uh, transparency and access and uh, uh, correction rights that I think could be very widely implemented and, and, and without huge cost and could really help us uh, to understand if there are specific uh, air practices that require more legal attention. Um, I, so I think we could have a privacy law that articulates those broad requirements and then relies to, to a certain extent on um, the companies that hold the data and, and, and privacy advocates to come up with best practices that meet those requirements. I think that part of what we've learned in environmental regulation is that uh, some of the kind of more command and control regulatory models that, that, that have long cycle rulemaking processes tend to get behind the technology and behind business practices, and there's more of a reliance on um, kind of results-oriented regulation where the requirement is on the company, achieve this result. We don't care how you do it. You go figure it out. Uh, I think that model can be very effective in the privacy realm because I think there are responsible companies that do put a lot of effort into good privacy practices, but there are a lot of companies that are not responsible, that don't feel they need to expend any effort whatsoever. Those are the ones that Julia couldn't find. Uh, my, I, two students of mine did a study of 600,000 plus uh, Android uh, uh, apps. Um, um, uh, of the ones that collect and use personal data, fewer than 10% of them even have privacy policies. And that's an inexcusable situation. Uh, uh, so, so we need law to, to, to make it clear to the long tail, as it were, that they've got to pay some attention. Right. I, I'm going to ask Jennifer to go next because I want to give Julia the last oh, word. Sure. And we're okay. coming up I'm, on the last I'm word. Good. I just had to say. <laughs> well, I, know, I know we're running out of time. I'll be quick. And I'm, I, I, I totally agree with Julia's <coughs> comment about it takes it all. I think we're in a window right now, and quite frankly, I don't think we'll see any kind of baseline privacy legislation out of Washington till, till at the earliest 2017. Uh, I think we're just, the political situation there for lots of reasons is just not going to get, this issue is not going to rise to the top. Um, that said, uh, I have a real concern that we may see some privacy law enacted in the states. Uh, we've seen California to start to step down that path in small ways, and I think in the end that could be really, really uh, disastrous. Uh, we never end up with the same norms. Look at what we did with security breach laws starting in about 2003 when California passed theirs, and now we're up to 48 or whatever it is states that have them. Uh, they're all just a little different. We can't get a federal bill passed even though business and uh, government agree, primarily because every time we try to pass one, we want to add something else to the bill that they can't agree on, so it dies in committee so, or um, on a vote. So uh, I think we are in a troubled situation from a legal perspective right now, and that's why, you know, I really are, am urging in all the business circles that we, we run in um, more uh, industry proactive codes of conduct uh, and developing solutions to some of these challenges that at some point, as Julie said, will become law. <laughs> right, at some point. So, um, you know, I think we're, it sounds like we're in violent agreement here that um, <laughs> you need to have uh, a, a lot of different aspects or a lot of different uh, ways of, of trying to approach the problem. Uh, so I thoroughly agree. I, um, you know, the technological arms race and the role of technology, that's what my talk was about. My talk was, you know, there are lots of debates going on in Washington, in Sacramento, in Brussels, and other um, places about what is the right policy and what, what laws should uh, be implemented. And those conversations will continue. And it may be that Washington, because it, we're unable to get our acts together in terms of um, policy development, we may be following rather than leading. 
what Brussels does, what Sacramento does, and maybe what some other states do. I have a different view on the state's role, but that's a, you know, a whole other panel. We'll talk about that some other time. So policy, I think, does play an important role, but I'm not sanguine that anything's going to happen anytime soon. I think technology, it's v therefore, it's very important that you all step up. The technological arms race is here. I mean, we're already experiencing it. There's a good side to it. Julius described the bad side. But there are companies that are differentiating themselves on privacy. And I think that to the extent that you, know, you see folks saying, OK, we can't use cookies anymore. We're going to start to use fingerprinting. Well, you have other folks thinking, well, if they're going to start using fingerprinting, how can we try to defeat that so that consumers' choices around tracking still remain effective? So I think the technological arms race will, consumers are always underfunded. But what I'm hoping to see is that some companies will step into the breach on behalf of consumers and say, OK, we know what these guys are up to. Let's see if we can figure out a way to defeat their efforts to get around consumers' choices. I think that that's a very important development. I think you all can play a role in that. The, the point of my talk was to build a bridge between the policymakers and the technology community. I think we need to start talking about building lots of bridges. And um, you know, we're going to be talking about that, I think, in the coming months and, months and years. But the, one of the ways to build the bridge is through this kind of ethical training. So that people like me, or Danny, or Catherine can come in and talk to the folks who are designing these products, whether it's a connected car, a smart watch, Google Glass, or whatever, and say, OK, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And can you, can you design this in a way so you don't place so much of a burden on consumers? And you give them choices, important choices, but you design in privacy when you can to try to help the consumer who is completely at a loss for dealing with all these issues on his or her own. That's a great wrap up. <laughs> and I'm happy I, uh, to wrap on that. I want to uh, offer the opportunity for the audience to applaud. <laughs> I think the, the applause is uh, well deserved. It's uh, an extraordinary applause among the best. <laughs> well, with that, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists, um, Jennifer, Julia, and Danny, and our um, moderator, uh, Kathy. I think that's what you call it. Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, especially uh, Julie for your ex excellent presentation and your final wrap-up. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. uh, many people uh, contributed uh, to making this an exciting and informative event, uh, one that will uh, all walk yeah. away with deep food for thought and possible action, including uh, the techies in the audience. Uh, but let me take a moment to give you special thanks for the diligence and careful attention to detail to my staff and other people who uh, participated in this. Marlene Lee Kang, uh, Lisa Bellantuano, John Vivolo, Sebastian August, Diana Perez, and our super event consultant, Elaine Cacciarelli. My name is Jake Miller, and I just graduated from the NYU Poly Cybersecurity Master's Program. The NYU Poly online program really suited my needs. I could sit down in front of a computer and take all of my courses, perform all of my coursework, and be able to do it without interrupting significantly my family life. The greatest benefit that I've experienced with this program is really the ability to connect with other people in my company. We really had a chance to bond together and we made a great team when it came to team projects. We could turn out a paper in three days that we were assigned two weeks to do, which was really nice and made me really proud. It really appeared like the professors um, took an interest in what was happening around them and made sure that we all knew about it and learned from it. I've been able to learn a lot of tips and tricks which I could then take and apply to my career. I would recommend the Poly Cohort Program to anyone. It will take your skills that you have already and really multiply them. It's an excellent program and I've had a lot of fun doing it.